Uh, right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, and thank you, uh, Professor Ahmed, for your very kind invitation. Uh, my, so I've been asked to take a topic for SD3 registrars. So I'm going to keep it basic, and which means we're going to talk about scaphoid uh, sort of anatomy, radiology, blood supply, classification, fractures, and management. Uh, these are the topics that we're going to cover today, right from surface anatomy to articulations, to blood supply, to the mechanism of injury, classification, management, and uh, approaches. So let's start with uh, surface anatomy. Uh, so this is the dorsal uh, view, dorsal picture of a wrist. And uh, what we are talking about here relevant to scaphoid is this number two. That's where the scaphoid ligament is. And this is how you palpate the scaphoid unit ligament with your thumb. Relevant clinical uh, relevances in scaphoid unit ligament injuries, that's where the pain uh, is going to be. Uh, then again, sticking to the dorsum, that's where the number two is. And as you palmar flex, the proximal pole will become prominent dorsally. So if your thumb moves ever so slightly radial, and from scaphoid ligament, you can start uh, palpating proximal pole of scaphoid. Uh, then coming to the waist, uh, best way to palpate is hand goes in ulnar deviation. And number three is radial styloid, four is waist, five is trapezium. So if you put your thumb in the anatomical snuff box, that's where you can palpate the waist of scaphoid. Then coming to the volar aspect, uh, again, number seven is the tubercle of scaphoid, and then further down will be trapezium. And that's where uh, you're going to feel the scaphoid tubercle. And if you go further down, you're going to feel the trapezium uh, tubercle. Relevant clinical uh, uh, thing significance is sometimes for FCR tendonitis is the number eight, the tubercle of trapezium, where the FCR tendon rubs, gets inflamed, and a patient comes to see you. And uh, relevance of number seven is, that's where the tubercle is. That's where you put your incision for your volar approach. Then coming to the movements and function of scaphoid. So again, as you go from radial deviation to a full ulnar deviation, scaphoid will go from flexion to full uh, extension, uh, which is the basis of your Watson-Kirk test. And the other relevance is when you do an x-ray to pick up a fracture scaphoid, if you are given only one view, uh, you want to ask for a PA rest view with ulnar deviation. Function, again, scaphoid is a link uh, between proximal row and distal row. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, I'll put some pictures of scaphoid unit dissociation and scaphoid uh, non-union here. These are the two common things that you see in your practice as a hand surgeon. <clears throat> In terms of articulations, uh, so scaphoid is going to articulate with the scaphoid fossa of radius, lunate, capitate, trapezium, trapezium and trapezoid. Uh, ligaments and the following fuse lines are important. So looking at the dorsum, so carpus, carpal bones have intrinsic ligaments and extrinsic ligaments, intrinsic between the two carpal bones. So if you look at the picture on the right, uh, scaphoid, lunate, that's your dorsal scaphoid lunate ligament. So it's not through and through, it's just distally. That's your intrinsic ligament, which is of relevance because scaphoid lunate injuries are very common. In terms of extrinsic dorsal ligaments, extrinsic, extrinsic to the carpal bones, they are basically thickenings of the capsule. So you don't see them separate to capsule. Uh, and again, if you see the picture to the right, they're centered over tricutrum. And then if you see this picture, so there's a dorsal radio tricutral ligament uh, coming from radius to tricutrum. And then there's a, another ligament which is going from all the four distal carpal bones, and then they have confluence and they attach to the tricutrum. Now, these are the pictures which are very kindly lent to me by Mr. Compson. I did my fellowship under him at uh, uh, King's College. 
and I'm very grateful to him for lending me all these such lovely pictures. Uh, and then if you want to know where the capsule attaches dorsally, uh, so that's scaphoid, that's the capsule. Scaphoid, that's the capsule, that's where the capsule attaches. Then coming to the volar side, we're going to look at the intrinsic ligaments and extrinsic ligaments. In terms of intrinsic ligaments, again, volar, scapholeunate ligament, scaphoid, ligament going to the trapezium, scaphotrapezial ligament, scaphotrapezoid ligament, scaphocapitate ligament. So those are the intrinsic. Uh, that's again just a picture of scaphocapitate ligament. Then coming to the volar extrinsic ligaments. So radius, scaphoid, that's capitate, partly drawn. Radiocapitate or radioscaphocapitate ligament, which is also known as sling ligament. Very important because this is the ligament which, which has some blood supply to the scaphoid. And this is the ligament you go through for your volar approach. Then of course, there's a radiolunate ligament. I've just put, put this picture here, even though it's not relevant to scaphoid. It's flexor carpe radialis. As I was saying before, trapezium, trapezial ridge. That's where FCR rubs, gets tendonitis. And the surgery for that is you excise the, you nibble out the uh, trapezial ridge so that the FCR tendon doesn't rub on it. Now let's look at the blood supply. Very important, very relevant to exam and to your practice because we know scaphoid like your tailors can have avascular necrosis. So uh, if I show you in the following slides, so one thing to note here is how this dorsal carpal branch gives retrograde supply to the proximal pole. And then if I take you to this slide, so that's the volar side, radial artery. It goes under the first extensor compartment and gives a dorsal carpal branch and continues as a superficial palmar branch. Some blood supply to the distal pole and base comes from the superficial palmar branch. Then if you come to the dorsum, that's the dorsal carpal artery. And this is the main supply. In fact, all of the supply to the proximal pole comes through the dorsal carpal branch. So it enters the ridge of scaphoid and gives that retrograde blood supply, which we saw in the first picture. So this is just one of my patients, just to show abductor pollicis longer. So first extensor compartment. And you can see that's the volar surface, that's the dorsal surface. How the radial artery dips under the first extensor compartment and comes back. So this is sitting right where the scaphoid uh, ridges. And then it will give a supply to uh, the proximal pole. And this is again another dissection, uh, essentially uh, showing the scaphoid, uh, how the retrograde supply comes there, basically. Then radiology of scaphoid, again, very relevant, very important, uh, because these are the x-rays you will ask for to diagnose a fracture. And these are the x-rays or II images you will look for when you put a screw to fix a scaphoid. So ulnar deviated view, we've spoken about it. You can see the scaphoid in its entirety. So this, is, this view is very important because you can see the whole scaphoid and diagnose a fracture. Lateral view, can't see a lot because scaphoid interposes on lunate. But important here is the relationship of the scaphoid proximal pole to lunate proximal pole. So in subtle scaphoid ligament injuries, scaphoid is going to sublux out ever so slightly dorsally and this relationship is gone. So if you see scaphoid is sitting in lunate, uh, it is, it's going to sublux, it's going to tend to come out. So this, is a import, this view is important for this reason. So you can pick up your DC in scaphoid unit injuries in this view. Same again, uh, because it's very important. So scaphoid, lunate, again, Mr. Compson slide, he's a world authority on scaphoid. So I requested him to lend me his slides uh, for anatomy purpose. Scaphoid, lunate, see how scaphoid sits in lunate. And in DC, in scaphoid unit injuries, scaphoid will tend to come out. So very important view. Uh, 45 degree supination. So this view is just to see, so this is the scaphoid there. And you can't see the distal pole, it's sitting in capitate, but you can clearly see the proximal pole. So 45 degree supination view is only to see the proximal pole. And as opposed to 45 degrees 
pronation view will give you an idea about the distal pole. So if you see here, proximal pole is all superimposed now. You don't know where the boundaries are. You can clearly see your proximal pole. So when you're doing a screw fixation, which we're going to see in the uh, coming slides, to make sure screw is not prominent proximally or distally, these two views are really important. Then remember uh, fracture lines, scaphoid, because it's a bean-shaped bone, it's a very twisty bone. No, no x-ray, not, not on any x-rays can you clearly see the fracture pattern. So if you're doing any non-union work, if you do not know whether the fracture is in a waist or a proximal pole in those subtle sort of injuries, always get a CT scan. CT is your best friend for your scaphoid work. And if you have to do x-rays to look for displacements, then oblique views are your best friends. For example, oblique view here. So that's one view where you can see sort of your fracture lines and your displacement. Uh, then again, uh, remember scaphoid is a very twisty bone. So when you're doing your screw fixation, unless you do all the four views, which we've discussed about, it's very hard to put your screw in one third of scaphoid, to center it in the scaphoid. So get all four views. So now let's come to the mechanism of injury. So we all know it's a hyperextension injury, the subtle radial deviation. So it can be someone falling to the ground and breaking the fall with the hand. Or remember footballers, goalkeepers, linesmen, even spectators. So I'll get one or two patients every year who had gone to see a football match and they caught a football and got a scaphoid fracture. So remember that. So it's a hyperextension injury. The proximal pole locks into your scaphoid fossa. Distal pole, as the hand is hyperextending, continues to go dorsally and get a waist scaphoid fracture. So once we've seen a bit of anatomy, radiology, blood supply, ligaments, now let's come to scaphoid fractures. Uh, so these are the few things which we're gonna discuss in the following slides. Diagnosis, imaging, indications to fix, techniques and types of immobilization. So diagnosis, history, hyperextension injury, symptoms, remember it's an intra-articular fracture. So the patient is gonna have diffuse pain. He's gonna come with hemarthrosis. Signs, uh, because it's a hemarthrosis like your intracapsular neck of femur, there's not a lot of bruising. Use your landmarks, which I showed you in the anatomy, to feel for waist, proximal pole, and your scaphoid tubercle. And then if you're suspecting an injury, get an X-ray, get all the four views, but remember 15, 16% are missed. Scaphoid fracture very commonly mistaken for a sprain. And other thing is the mean age for scaphoid fracture is young men around 22, 23 years of age. If you miss a scaphoid fracture, if you tell him you got a sprain, go home, sir, and then Obviously, he's young, he's strong, he can overcome pain. He doesn't come to you, goes into non-union. He can end up having a snack, which is very disabling. He can't do his job. So that's why scaphoid is very important because it can create disability in young men uh, who could have been very productive to society and for their families. So, so you need to get all the four views, bit of repetition, ulnar deviation, lateral view, supination view for proximal pole, pronation view for distal pole. And if you're worried, these days there are even talks that you can get a limited series MRI scan because it will pick up scaphoid edema or subtle fractures rather than missing those uh, 10 to 15% scaphoid uh, fractures as sprain. Uh, but obviously there are cost implications. Uh, so this is just sort of discussion it's not put into practice, it's not part of NICE guidelines as yet. Also remember with MRI, if there are scaphoid ligament injuries, rather than a scaphoid fracture, MRI or MR arthrogram will pick up. CT, uh, CT is your best friend uh, if you do hand surgery. CT will pick up fracture type, whether it's a waist or a proximal pole. It will tell you fracture pattern. It will tell you displacement. So those late presenters <clears throat> for non-unions, you can pick up humpback deformities on your sagittal CT scans. Depending on where the fracture is proximal pole or waist, 
you can tell your patient about prognosis you can tell your patient about uh, approach volar or dorsal uh, again ct is good for healing so if at 6 weeks in a waist out of plaster patient is still very tender i can't give him plaster for another 4 weeks it's a waist fracture i've already tried for 6 weeks then professor joe dias uh, has said get a ct scan and see if there are br bridging trabeculae and if there are none then no point uh, wasting more time for the patient get on and do the surgery so ct is your best friend for scaphoids herbert classification very briefly so a is basically a stable fracture incomplete fracture a1 is a tubercle a2 is a incomplete waste b again start from distal pole displace distal pole displace waste display proximal pole and transcaphoid parilunate injury b5 is a comminuted scaphoid c is a delayed scaphoid uh, union and uh, sorry c is a delayed union type d is a non union plaster immobilization again uh, a normal colis cast is as good as a thumb spica cast uh, the reason being in a colis cast yes you can move your thumb but it doesn't generate enough movement at the fracture site to stop healing so colis cast is as good as a scaphoid as a uh, scaphoid plaster but remember in a, the only exception is proximal pole for some reason if patient has lots of medical issues doesn't want a surgery then you need to immobilize thumb uh, length of plaster treatment so it's basically it can vary from 6 to 10 weeks six roughly six weeks around the waist fracture up to 10 weeks in a proximal pole uh, again this is an important slide indications for early fixation of scaphoid fractures uh, so all your carpal fracture dislocations your parilunate injuries your transcaphoid parilunate injuries those are the ones you need to fix displaced fractures so it's a difficult one but again modern thinking is up to 2 mm which is part of swift trial which we'll discuss later you should give it a trial of non operative more than 2 mm you should get on and fix not sort of sit uh, not manage it non operatively fractures through cis so again scaphoid is an intra articular fracture uh, like you get your geodes in hip arthritis intra articular synovial fluid goes through the stablum same thing happens here as patient flexes synovial fluid will get pushed into both ends of the fracture into distal and proximal pole and you get cis so if you're seeing cis already they're not going to heal with the plaster all proximal poles should be fixed unless there's a contraindication for this reason 30 percent non-union because of retrograde blood supply which we saw before and then delayed presenters if someone comes after four weeks or was told a sprain still in pain comes to you at week four week six week eight and now you can see scaphoid fracture with or without cis because there's a high chance of non-union so this is an important slide what about undisplaced waste so two schools of thought should we fix it early undisplaced can we do a percutaneous screw fixation or should we treat it in a plaster so nice paper margaret mcqueen edinburgh 2008 so they took 60 patients half they fixed half they immobilized in a cast randomly allocated if you do a percutaneous fixation healing is quicker nine weeks versus around 14 weeks with a plaster if young active man sportsman you can go to sports early around seven weeks versus 16 weeks with a plaster if you work in a central london office a young man time is of essence to you time to you can return to work as early as four weeks versus 11 weeks so yes percutaneous fixation has advantages but also remember it's a surgery it will have complications screw can protrude infections anesthesia and also at at the final follow-up at year and a half two years both patients screw versus a plaster will do equally well so the recommendation by edinburgh group was all these young sportsmen because remember it's an injury mean age of injury is young men 22 years of age so all these young men who are into sports 
or for whom return to work equals money or is important, those are the ones where you can recommend a percutaneous screw fixation. But you need to bring in the complications, have a discussion, and then they can make a decision. Uh, if you decide a percutaneous fixation, then you have to do it under II. And so uh, sort of look for the tubercle area, get your entry point with K wire. Once you're happy, a stab incision, drive the wire under II guidance, do all your four views, and then use any of your variable pitch screw. So, and then of course, uh, let's talk about other methods of fixation, i.e. your open approaches. So you can do a volar approach for a waist fracture or a dorsal approach for a proximal pole fracture. So depending on uh, where the fracture is, if in doubt, get a CT scan. So let's see the volar approach. So th roughly that's the incision centered over scaphoid tubercle as we saw in the anatomy. Uh, looking at the schematic diagram, uh, Incision is over flexor carpi radialis tendon, that's tubercle, and you aim towards sort of mid of trapezium if you like. Uh, be aware of the nerve and the palmocutaneous branch. And then again, as we saw before, that's your radio capitate or radio scapho capitate ligament, your sling ligament. And when your approach is like this, you're going to go halfway through it. So, for example, here, so you so with this incision, you have to go direct down to the bone. You will not see the ligament. It's a thickening of a capsule. And you make two good flaps so that in the end, when you stitch it up, your ligament and your capsule will heal up. So let's see an example. So young man, 24, I saw him in the clinic. Uh, he was a delayed presenter. So that's why in the x-ray, I saw a very clear line. And I thought, are these cysts on my, as you can see, PA, wrist, ulnar deviation old scaphoid extended. I got a CT scan and indeed there were cysts and there were cysts, but there's, there's no hum back there on a sagittal CT. So always get a CT if in doubt with a scaphoid. Now this is a waist fracture. So we'll do a volar approach as we spoke about. Uh, and these are some of my slides on that patient. So incision, as we just discussed about, this is after I've opened it. So once I curated out all the cysts, there was a bit of a gap. So we decided to take a volar graft from radius. Uh, and this is the me after having taken the graft. Then important is don't put the graft now. First get your wire because your wire has to be centered. You may need two or three passes. You don't want your graft to disperse everywhere. So once you put your wire, you've done your eye images, you're happy it is all well centered. Then you use your cancellous chips and a very thin piece of cortical bone. Thin piece of cortical bone, why? Because we know bone will resorb and then new bone will form. So cortical bone takes a long time to resorb compared to cancellous. So you don't want to put a big, thick cortical piece. And then once I've done that, so graph done, that hole in radius is still there. Personally, I use DBX. I don't use a bone wax. Uh, DBX helps in many ways, St stops bleeding, encourages uh, uh, bone formation. And sometimes if I've only used cancellous chips, I can put my cortical piece back on DBX. It holds it in place. Then uh, let's see another example, 46 year old, hyperextension injury, and you need to get all these four views. So ulnar deviation, you can see the whole length of scaphoid and there's a fracture at the waist. Supination view, I can see proximal pole. Pronation view, I can see my, prox my distal pole and my lateral view. So once I'm happy that it's a waste, I don't need a CT for this case. And then uh, the reason I put these two views is pronation, supination views. Pronation view, you can see the distal pole to make sure the screw is not prominent. Supination view, only to see the proximal pole to make sure screw is not prominent in, in the uh, sort of proximal pole area. And also remember for proximal pole scaphoid fractures, uh, which we're gonna see in the next slides, the final X-ray has to be one year. So let's come to the dorsal approach. Uh, so dorsal approach proximal for proximal pole fractures, 
is going to be centered around Lister's tubercle between third and fourth extensor compartment. Dorsal approach, you can break into three small steps. First, your internervous plane, your dorsal radial cutaneous nerve and your dorsal ulnar cutaneous nerve. So you make nice thick flaps, uh, skin and fat flaps, and your cutaneous nerves will go with them. So that's your first step. Second will be your retinaculum. Just for scaphoid work, you only need to incise the distal half of retinaculum between compartment three and compartment four. Once you've done that, this is the view you're going to get. And just to make it a bit more clear, so this is scaphoid, scaphoid, scapholunate ligament, lunate. So to see this, third step is your capsule. Again, only for scaphoid work, you only partially need to incise your capsule. Your modified Mayo flap. So you, all you need to do is incise capsule at the rim of radius and you'll start getting this view. And I put a little marker pen here to show you where the entry point for your screw in a dorsal approach should be. So this entry point is very close to where your scaphoid unit ligament is, uh, which is this point. So dorsal approach, uh, three steps. First, cutaneous nerves, so skin and fat, thick flaps. Second, retinaculum. Third, capsule, your modified Mayo flap. So let's see this example, a 29-year-old male, again, hyperextension injury. So you can see is this line looks more towards proximal pole. So I got a CT scan and I can see some dorsal uh, spurs, dorsal ostify. So I know it's a fairly old injury, it's not a new injury. And again, and also for exam purposes, yes, proximal pole, you get an MRI for AVN. For me as a hand surgeon, CT scan does, uh, helps me, uh, suffices. In the sense, I can see there's a bit of AVN going on there, but I'm not too overtly concerned. There's no fragmentation. Proximal pole is not very dense. So I know I don't need to do a vascularized graph and MRI is almost not needed even with non-unions and scaphoid. But for exam purpose, you get an MRI to look for AVN. Uh, and then of course, I did a dorsal approach as we discussed, uh, used a bit of graft from dorsal radius and then screw fixation. And this is important. Final X-ray for proximal pole work is one year, not three months, not six months final check x-ray one year, because sometimes even after six months, they may not have healed completely. And if patient does heavy work, it can all get undone and they can get into a snap uh, arthritis years later. Uh, and then finally, the last slide, a uh, SWIFT trial. Uh, this was done by Professor Joe Dias in 2020. And Professor Dias has written a lot on scaphoid. So you can read up on his other papers also. It was a pragmatic multi-center trial, over 30 hospitals, over 400 patients. And the, sorry, and the reason for this was scaphoid, as I said, it happens in a young man between 20 and 25, that's the mean age. 10, 15% are sent home as sprains. These patients, they never come back and then they go into non-union and five, seven, eight years down the line, they get snack, they get very painful wrist and that's the time they come to us. But by that time it's too late and either they need a partial wrist fusion or a total wrist fusion, which is a bit disabling. And they've lost so many of their productive decades actually. So, so what, what's happening is, and it's a very common carpal fracture, nine out of 10 carpal fractures will be in scaphoid and young men. So because of these reasons, surgeons, the trend is to fix them early because you're worried you will sort of, you're worried in a clinic that they may not come back. You're, you're worried that your registrar may have, or in a a &E or a GP may have thought of it as a sprain. Uh, and then anyways, 10% patients who are managed in a plaster, 10 to 12% go into non-union. So the trend was to surgically fix more and more. But as we know, surgery has its own implications, GA, cost, com complications, cost involved in second surgery. So hence the SWIFT trial came into being. And 
what it looked at was the effectiveness of surgical fixation, early surgical fixation, with just a plaster cast, but then early fixation of fractures that fail to unite. So as I was saying, at six weeks in a waist, at four to six weeks, the patient is very painful. Rather than carrying on with the plaster, you get a CT. If it's going into non-union, you jump in at that stage and operate. So this is where SWIFT trial uh, came. And obviously displacement criteria was two millimeter or less. So if it's displaced day one, more than two millimeter, then you offer patient surgery straight away. But if the displacement is less, one, one, one and a half, two millimeters, then the SWIFT trial wanted to know is surgery, early surgery better, or plaster treatment, and then surgery for non-union better. And what they found was for scaphoid waste, less than two millimeter displacement should have an initial plaster. And then at six weeks, if you're suspecting a non-union, confirm it by CT and then immediately fix it. Uh, so, so by adopting this, all the risks of surgery, which we just discussed, uh, will be eliminated. Uh, so this was a very important trial and I would encourage you to read SWIFT trial by Professor Joe Dias and maybe some of his other work on scaphoid. And I think this is the last slide. So I, I wish you good luck with your training in the future years. Uh, who knows, some of you may choose to become hand surgeon. It's an amazing sort of part of the musculoskeletal system. And uh, thank you once again to Prof Amit, Mr. Thompson for lending me some of his slides. And thank you for your kind attention.